members of the NIT family. I think that should cover everyone. So first of all, a big thank you to the two gentlemen who introduced me for their very kind words. I had a very, very long association, have a kind of very long association with NIT. Uh, it's now 24 years since we started it. And um, my entire career as chess world champion was during that association. So it is always with very, very fond memories uh, that I visit the family. And uh, I'd also like to thank Vijay for that very entertaining speech. He always makes it quite funny. So there is this thing called the Turing test, which was supposed to distinguish computers and humans. So you pass the Turing test when a computer can imitate a human without uh, you being able to tell. But Vijay managed um, imitation, mimicry of a human trying to act like ChatGPT and us being unsure who was who. <laughs> so after that, I will now um, take you into um, my thoughts on how you shape our mind. Obviously, this is a process that happens naturally by itself. It's happening all the time. Uh, you can choose to move the direction a bit, but essentially, our brain is always being shaped. So in my case, very early, I could start I learned how to play chess at the age of six from my mother. And, uh, and then the process that drove it was simply um, the chess club, competition, interacting with other chess players, and learning the right habits because they were self-rewarding. When I practiced often, I got better at it, what we call fluency. You do something so often that it becomes second nature to you. Um, but also the conventions that you follow. Uh, at the end of the game, you shake hands of your of your opponent, regardless of the result. And then occasionally you ex exchange your thoughts about the game. I mean, after all, this is the only other person alive on the planet who spent six hours thinking of the same game. So why wouldn't you exchange thoughts? Um, and a lot of your chess improvement is simply this. Uh, discipline, the need to keep working. Uh, it's driven by deadlines. You know, you have a tournament tomorrow, a game coming soon. But the far more important uh, effect is from experiences. There are childhood memories of me losing the last round of some under 10 tournament in the club, which still influence the choices I make today in the chessboard because it was painful. It was painful, so I learned never to do that thing again. Even when it's probably quite good now. I mean, if I look at the data, it's clear that it's not that the strategy I chose was wrong, it's just the way I executed it. But uh, all your life, you've been shaped by this preference. And this effect is surprisingly strong. Most chess players have a very, have a very pronounced style, and it's based on these, these good and bad memories from very young. So we all know the story of, let's say, an elephant. Um, once when it's very young, it learns that it can't do something and it never corrects itself. Um, it's, it's very similar, I suspect, in all walks of life. But um, these good and painful memories, when you're young, if you feel that you're really good at something, you'll keep doing it uh, and your optimism is way above what should be permitted. So. Another very, very important thing is curiosity. Luckily for all of us, nature gives us a certain amount, you know, just part of the package. You're born, you have some curiosity. Uh, anybody who's had a two-year-old child can tell you that the curiosity is the most powerful force. Sense of danger doesn't come close. You, if there's an electric switch, you must know what happens if you press it. 
you know, everything that is dangerous has to be done. So we are born with this curiosity, but um, it can be cultivated and you can work on it. And um, that again shapes your mind. And the final thing, again, we start very young. We, uh, we have our family, we have our friends, and each one of these influences slowly comes. There are friends that you look up to, you think they're cool in some way, and you'll try to imitate them, and you'll try to do this all your life. Um, and the, con the reverse as well. Now, this is fine so, so far as it goes, but um, the interesting question which I would like to discuss today is, what are the things we can do actively? What are the things we can do consciously? Most of the things I mentioned are simply uh, second nature. They happen in the background, we don't even realize they're happening. And um, we're very, very, we have strong likes and dislikes. We've already been shaped in a certain way. Now, can you um, address this? One of the things I found in chess, as I mentioned, you know, strongly shaped with preferences. <clears throat> the public uh, idea of a chess player is of someone with almost perfect memory. Um, not true, by the way. Um, amazing ability to concentrate. Not true, by the way. And um, able to think many, many moves ahead. Not, not true, by the way. <laughs> um, so memory is very, very uh, context-based. My chess memory is amazing. You know, I won't deny it. Once upon a time, I could remember, even when I was 24, 25, I could remember every single game I played in my life almost. But again, context is important. I, um, I found that slowly, as the number of games uh, multiplied in my databases, uh, computers came along quite late in the, at that stage, but uh, in my uh, development, but as the number of games multiplied, the number of events multiplied, you realized you just can't keep up. In fact, the brain has switched. It uh, stops, stops trying to remember every single game you played and every move you made. It focuses on experiences, what's relevant. Um, what, what, do I need this or not? And then it starts pruning away. Again, most of you will experience this with your phones. Once upon a time, I'm sure all of you could remember the top 10 numbers you dialed. Now, uh, you just, since the contact book is just one uh, thumb impression away, uh, you don't even need that. And the brain rewires itself to do something else. How do I train my memory? So, simple thing is to follow some sort of schedule. And I only do this for chess, by the way, because in most other things, um, well, I'll, I'll come to that later. So, in, in chess, the lines I need to know, the things that I think I will not be able to work out at the board on my own, I make a note of seeing it in some, uh, in some regular interval. I read this, by the way, somewhere, and I thought, well, that makes sense, I should do it. The theory is, you see something daily for a while, then weekly, then monthly, and uh, by the 11th year, it's encoded in your brain in such a way with so many multiple uh, inputs that you will never ever forget it. Again, very easy to see. Um, I can remember certain childhood experiences just locked in for life, but uh, you struggle with things that you do uh, on a daily basis and, uh, and so on. Then it's very easy. You take the notes that you need to look at. Um, you um, see them in some regular interval. But one level above, of the, above that is context. If you have a story you can add to it, remembering this will help me avoid my fate in that game against that person. This, um, will, this is the way I won this beautiful title. You know, this is the way some famous game that I grew up with in my childhood ended. If you can attach those things, then 
much faster. You will, you don't need to wait the full 11 years in theory. Uh, the memory gets locked in. So with memory, it's very important to reinforce it. How uh, would I do this? Remind These days typically is reminders. I'll have reminders on my phone, on my computer, set to go off at periodic intervals. Um, daily, you don't even look at it and you stop looking at it. So you just, it's there, but you just breeze away. But if it comes in some uh, regular interval, you'll remember to notice. And slowly over time, it's a note you've made of that you don't forget easily. Um, if there's a memory attached, as I mentioned, it's much more effective. And a lot of our memories are like this. It's emotional. And if you attach emotions to anything, you'll remember it, you'll execute it better and everything. You'll never forget the details. What gets us every time is boredom. Repetitive, I mean, we do things every day uh, and that's the thing we practice the most. But because it's boring and it's repetitive, there will come a day when you simply forget to do it because you've done it every single day, you just, it just slips your mind. This can happen in chess. Uh, the simplest things I will sometimes end up at the board and realize that I've forgotten the detail even though it's the thing I've done most in chess. Um, so you can decide, and this is what a training camp in chess is like. It starts off with visualizing yourself. I'm sitting in the board in front of this opponent. It helps if you imagine how pleasant or unpleasant that opponent is to look at, because you'll be sitting opposite that opponent for a couple of hours. Um, while they're trying to do ha harm to you on the chessboard, admittedly. And, uh, if you can visualize that experience at an emotional level, at, a, at thing, then you can work backwards. Now, these are the things that I expect to get, go wrong at the board. These are the things I can hope for to go right. And then you decide, if that's my aim, then what are the positions I should aim for? What are the positions with the maximum probability of success? And then you work backwards in your training. You don't start with, uh, this is the work that needs to be done without knowing what the end result that you, you want. And it's heavily dependent on your opponent, obviously. Um, you can bring in this idea of a regular exposure to new experiences. Um, you can try to imagine doing something for the first time that you haven't done before. In my case, positions that I've avoided all my life I finally thought, let me face this once. Instead of avoiding it, let me see if I can actively do it. I always give myself a lot of time. I don't like to drop myself in an unpleasant situation, but I give myself some time. You allow yourself to build familiarity. You um, uh, train yourself in these positions. Sometimes the reason you're avoiding them is because you decided very young, I'm bad at them. So you need to give your time, yourself time to make that mental adjustment. And then I have trainers do this with me. I mean, I would rather get the embarrassing bits over with at home. So I'll have my trainer play this embarrassing position, this difficult position against me. Uh, once I've messed it up four or five times, I'll get it right, the sixth or seventh attempt. And uh, then you have something positive to take away. Now, if I can actually play it at the board in an actual tournament and get away, then that's another level of confidence. And you've overcome a fear. Um, one of the things that helped me do this was um, the entrance of computers into chess. Computers started coming in, I mean, their level of playing chess started to become quite high about 25 years ago. Um, and then a few years later, they started beating the best humans, then beating them consistently, then beating them all the time. And then they started shrinking. So a top, a good, a very good laptop could beat every, any human on earth. And then your phone could do it. And, uh, you know, in the future, who knows, maybe your washing machine will do it. Your, your microwave, while you're waiting for it to heat, <laughs> beats you as well. Uh, it would be so cool if the first word I said, by the way, was checkmate, but uh, I, I do not know if that's happened. With <laughs> but, and so then the process comes, if computers are stronger than us, initially 
it is something basic. The computers just don't make mistakes as often as we do. And that's why they win. Which means during a game, I can outperform quite in long stretches. But sooner or later, I'll make the last mistake and I'll lose. But then they got stronger and stronger and stronger. So even that area got squeezed. And um, about seven, eight years ago, uh, neural networks started playing chess. And then the level just went. Um, and it started challenging everything. You know, everything you think to be true. Um, it's difficult to draw an analogy. It's as if you're suddenly told that what you think is up is down and what you think is down is up. Uh, moves I was taught not to play. Um, the computer said, well, you can play them quite often. Things you're, sup you're supposed not to do, you can do. Things you think work all the time, don't work all the time. Roughly, I would say, since most of our impressions are formed by our own experiences, uh, it's statistical. You get this idea that if somebody something works 70%, 80% of the time, it'll probably work all the time. And if something doesn't work or 50, 60%, you think it's not worth bothering with. And then computers force you to um, get a much more precise number here. So you might realize that something you think works 80% of the time only works 65%, which means there's a good chance there are a lot of exceptions. And these exceptions keep on mounting in chess. Um, now there's a modern generation of chess players, mostly those born, um, let's say, the early 90s, uh, who have never known a world where uh, these old human rules were taught to them. They only learnt it from a modern perspective. So they find it slightly easier to adjust. For my generation, it's a constant uh, clash. Uh, there's something, some long forgotten memory of why something is good. And, um, and for having to confront the fact that it may not be so, and then being forced to understand why. Uh, challenging assumptions is one of the um, best ways to I think expand, well, shape your mind, because um, repetition, uh, intuition, second nature, all these things, they're so deep rooted, sometimes we don't even recognize them for what they are. Now, there are some natural ways to uh, change here. One thing is to meet people regularly who think differently from you, and over time will contradict you a lot. In chess, I often chose this. I would choose people who had a really different style, a style which almost offended me. I would uh, uh, get them on my team. We would work together. And over time, you realize, my god, I learned something today. Uh, they were right. This move which looks ugly to me might actually work. And, and after some time, you realize, well, what looks ugly to you actually looks beautiful to them. Um, these things are relative. But slowly I've expanded the range of positions I'm comfortable with. You can do it at the computer. You, I can sit there with the chess board um, and say, I want to improve in these areas, so I'm going to play against the computer. Highly structured, because it's going to beat me in the long run anyway, but highly structured. I just want to see if my impression for the next few moves matches the computer's output or not. Uh, I can get a trainer to help me with this. There are ways to structure it. But it's always about, about vis visualization. You imagine yourself in, the, in a crucial game, in that position, being forced to make decisions just like you would under pressure. How do you react? And then you map that out because those are betraying your uh, deepest impressions about chess. Your gut feeling, if you like. That's the only way you can peer into it. Um, in, in modern chess, we have this funny scenario that um, a player who comes, a chess player from 500 years ago, who time travels and comes to a modern tournament, will see something that looks more or less familiar to him. There's an opponent, there's a clock, and you're moving pieces. But if he saw our, our training methods, he would understand he's been dropped in a world 500 years later. Our training methods are so sophisticated. We're now scanning billions of games. Um, 
and nobody has the time to get into details anymore. So you just look for statistics. Does something work 51.1% of the time? Okay, let me see if I can squeeze some uh, value out of that. But the only value you can add is if you then take um, the games that you played under pressure, which is where you're really showing your true side. Uh, at the board, you're unsure of um, what you're supposed to do, and you're going with your gut feeling. When we calculate, we calculate to the best of our abilities, but uh, it comes back to what I said earlier uh, about how many moves ahead can you see. I can see a lot of moves ahead, but I don't know if what I'm seeing is right or wrong. There's a certain uncertainty baked into uh, how you play chess on the board, which simply is not there when you have a tool next to you. Um, and trying to visualize that and then um, keep coming back to um, you know, what is the right answer? What did I think was the right answer when I forced myself to think like that? back and forth, back and forth. And over time, you'll realize that um, you're playing moves you would have rejected. You're seeing new possibilities that um, uh, you would not have noticed before. But when you're shaping minds, you're, you're shaping habits. And you have to confront a habit. You have to slow down, break it down into steps, and uh, look at it. Otherwise, when you go out the door, you'll switch off the light with one hand without even realizing. You'll open the door and go out. If you want to do it differently, you'll have to uh, do that part more consciously. Obviously, I, I do this most of all in chess, but um, it's very important to um, just understand how deep our habits are. Um, then there's the question of the brain getting rest. We are used to the idea that, that all our organs, uh, our muscles, after exertion, you give them rest. The brain is the only thing which doesn't take any rest. Uh, the only way to give your brain rest is to give it something else to do. Um, so how do you work that into your life? I have found that the best way to recover from chess tournaments, and this is something that I confronted in failure. Every time I had a disastrous result, I was faced with the thing, problem that I hated chess. I did not want to look at it for a while. But without working on it, I can't get better again for the next one. And how do I get ready for the next event? And here, the value of hobbies and interests, which are unrelated to your main profession, in fact, unrelated to the idea of performance. There are things you must do for pleasure, which must still be challenging. That's how you get your brain uh, so for me, this could mean a good holiday. It could mean um, going out and looking at the stars for a while. Um, it could uh, mean reading a book. But it has to be something far enough away that you recover emotionally. The, the pain associated with the last tournament has to recede a bit. And quite often, after one or two weeks of no chess, doing something totally different, when I come back to work, I find that I'm, the hunger has come back a bit. I feel like working. My point is you cannot work on something if you're angry with yourself. Uh, and if you're angry with, um, well, in my case, it was chess. Um, you, you know, you feel betrayed. You feel, you know, I've worked so hard at this. How can this happen to me? Unless you can detach yourself from those feelings, it's very difficult to come back. But uh, having multiple hobbies, interests, friends allows you to recover much faster. But there's a, Second um, point, having friends is like having an intelligence network. You get a thousand eyes all looking at the world and you'll get a head start on so many things that you can't possibly keep track of yourself. Um, if you uh, have friends once in a while, they'll tell you, you know, something is interesting hap happening in this area. Now, this is true within chess, obviously, but it's true beyond. And you'll find out that um, there are things that actually interest you. You might want to pursue them. They might even impact your game and the way you play your game or how you execute your profession. Uh, 
And that gives you a little head start in preparing for it. But this comes back to the thing, you cannot do everything for performance. You cannot relax only for because I want to get better at chess later. You have to relax because you want to relax. You have to have friends because you like having friends. And the benefits will flow. But there is a little bit of serendipity involved and you, and you can't try to control that very much. Uh, and so part of the uh, challenge with the mind is um, the downtime. How you manage your downtime, how you have uh, interest and all effect, affect you. A, during the pandemic, the chess world turned um, into a completely new sport. Thanks to the fact that, and there were a lot of accidents which happened at the same time. There, it was uh, the Queen's Gambit show which suddenly appeared. They, they made the show without knowing there was going to be a virus next year. Uh, it's hard to believe that they knew there was going to be a virus and they decided to make this show, but there it was. Um, chess suddenly moved online. And uh, suddenly the value of communication in chess had uh, gone up. It wasn't necessary to be a good chess player to do well in chess. You could be someone who's a decent chess player, but who knew to how to explain it to new audiences. That was a skill that suddenly became very valuable. But the warning signs were always there. In fact, I found out later, uh, because I don't necessarily move in those circles, I found out later that already by 2016, people had started to do this on the uh, internet, um, in online communities, and uh, the numbers were uninteresting, so I probably wouldn't have paid attention. But they, they were playing around with it. And three, four years later, the ones who had started out then were the first ones to hit the ground running in 2020 because they immediately saw um, they were already on these platforms. They were working there. And the opportunity came their way. But you had to have been trying these skills or knowing people who happened to be there to suspect that this was going to happen. Or suspect that even this could be a fun thing to do. So it's, it's very important to have a broad circle of friends. You will have your core friends, but you must have people that you engage with casually, uh, exchanging ideas, and, um, and it's easier to make this a habit if you do it gradually. You can't do it one day and switch off the next. But if you develop the habit of uh, once a week trying something new, you know, once a month incorporating some new aspect uh, to the way you do things, and you let these habits accumulate, then it progresses much more naturally. Over time, you find yourself shifting as a person. Um, but gradual is always much, much uh, easier. Same goes for evolution um, in your main job. In chess, I'm constantly working, but I have to think, in one year, what is it that I'd like to be able to do extra? And then you start to work now, you add it slowly, a position a day, uh, slow training, you, you play training games with friends, you come back, you study the position, you go back again, you do this. We all, we can't, there's always a trade-off. And um, in life, quite often doing what you're best at is your best strategy for a lot of the day. Uh, so you're never going to be in a situation where you can be in full risk mode or full uh, study mode. But at the same time, you should realize that um, focusing on your strengths in a very narrow thing and saying, you know, that's brought me the best rewards, I'm going to stick to it, leaves you unprepared for when the world suddenly turns and that might not be a good strategy. So if you start moving along um, steadily, then even with all the unexpected turns that we have, you're ready. But it makes you a, a bigger person. You're, you have learned more skills. Uh, quite often, you're forced yourself to do something uncomfortable. And these things are very... Um, well. Now, um, about doing things that are uncomfortable and uh, difficult, I have found that it's often the way you look at it is more important than simply the stats. We often see decisions and we think, but the odds again that decision was 
not at all good, why did the person go ahead and do it? And it's a, it's a very individual trait. If you think you're good at something, then you're going to be wildly confident in everything you do, and you're going to misjudge your odds. But for a confident person, even 30% looks, like looks like great odds. For someone who doesn't like what they're doing, even 70% looks, oh, you know, still 30% can go wrong, is the river flip attitude. And uh, I think this evolution is what is the only thing you can shape your brain with. It has to be gradual, and it's about having good regular habits that you do. The normal things, sleep well, pay attention to your body, stay interested in multiple areas, be in touch with interesting people, keep an open mind, and when you learn something new, make a note of it, come back to it a couple of times over the days, and you'll find yourself moving along steadily. As uh, we mentioned earlier, I, I got a chance unexpectedly about three years back to start an academy for our um, youngest chess players. And so I picked four of them. My criteria was they should be 14 and they should be grandmasters. That would have sounded like a high bar in, um, in many countries, but I was very fortunate that uh, we had a sort of golden generation and there were four Indians who met that criteria right away. So uh, I got them into the academy. Now, what can I teach them? I'm not sure um, that there are any chess ideas that I can distill very easily and pass on to them. I don't even know why I think what I think. As I mentioned, most of my chess skills, if I try to sit down and, and uh, explain why something is good, I would fail. There is something called intuition. It is based on a lot of things that you've forgotten that you've looked at and studied, and it's accumulated in your head. It's got some gaps, but it's, it is a very, it's based on uh, what you've looked at. But it's subconscious. You cannot take it and pass it on to someone else. So if someone asks me, well, how will you teach this? I, in fact, I face the same problem. What am I going to tell them? Um, if I tell them something, they'll immediately go to the computer, check it themselves. Then they'll come back and say, no, uh, that thing you said, uh, the computer uh, contradicts you. And uh, so 40 years ago, the first academy on which I was inspired probably got away with a lot of stuff. Uh, but even then, there are stories of these youngsters popping up and saying, but that uh, Mr. Botvinnik, that position you said, um, I don't agree. And uh, Mr. Botvinnik was already in his 70s at that point, so I don't think he enjoyed it very much. But uh, my problem was, what should I try to pass on? And the answer is simply good habits and good values. And you can sh show them an example. Say, I, I don't know if this is the only thing you can do, but this is what, how, uh, what I do. This is how I approach this problem. And all my life experiences, my games, are most valuable only if I tell them, this is how I was sitting at the board at this moment. These were the stakes, but this is how I felt inside. This is how I view the situation, and this is the decision that I made. That's the only thing that I can pass on. Now it's up to them to take that experience and shape it into whatever approach they want to try. It's also possible it, it's quite early for them, a lot of my experiences. Uh, the way you approach chess when you're 14 or 15, with boundless optimism, is not how you approach chess when you play for very high stakes and um, your life has already been shaped by good experiences, which will lead you in one way, bad experiences, which lead you to try and avoid that. Um, you become much more conditioned. But nonetheless, what I try to pass on is curiosity, discipline, flexibility, this idea that we, um, we can be wrong and we can very easily be wrong. 
that they recognize that early. And despite all that, we can still produce a fantastic um, game of chess. Finally, I will say this. In the uh, context of AI and whether it will uh, replace us, as I mentioned, in chess, we have been forced down this uh, path. Uh, and AI already does a lot of chess much better than we do. In fact, I can almost never suggest a move with any confidence that it won't be at least, it won't be mostly wrong. It may be the right move, but my justification won't work, or it's simply the wrong move. But um, there is one thing we will forever be able to do that I, I have not seen any computer even come close to doing. It is that from the mass of uh, inputs, uh, the uh, little bits of knowledge that stumble out of the computer, we take a pattern and we find a rule connecting very disparate things. This is actually supposed to be an AI strength, but we do it much better, which is to take something that works in one field and see it in another. another. And computers, for instance, can play end games perfectly. Um, but if you look at their tables of the right move and the wrong move, they have simply mapped out every single legal move till the end. But one day a human will look, and it doesn't happen often, but one day a human will look and say, you know what, every time the queen is separated by six squares from the other queen, it seems to be a draw, or some rule like that. And humans can produce rules like that, in encoded in language, that computers will never be able to do. Um, oh, just to finish with the chat GPT story, um, a couple of months back, I wanted to find out uh, when the Champions League final was happening. So I wrote in uh, chat GPT, so tell me what's happening with uh, Real Madrid and City. So the computer, the chat GPT came out with this beautiful answer. It said, um, um, Real and Manchester are going to play on this day, uh, will play on this, actually a very confused sentence. They will play on this day in thing, and Madrid won the match. And I thought, what the hell? And it turned out it was taking last year's result, it threw it into this year's match, which was happening in the future, and made a total mess out of it. In fact, City won, <laughs> and uh, it looked ridiculous. But uh, I think we should not uh, lose the hope they can be, that we can produce uh, a very, very beautiful mind indeed. And uh, to all of you here, if you have found your way to NU University, I think you have just beaten the odds of doing that. Thank you. <laughs>